every time I was down, you know, I had parents there picking me up. I had students there picking me up. I had my guys helping me out. I had all of that support. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 9 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host and the founder of Whistlekick, where we make the world's best sparring gear. If you're new to the show, you can learn more about Whistlekick at whistlekick.com, and you can learn more about this show at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We try to keep it simple. On today's show, we have Shihan Andy Campbell, a karate school owner from Maine. I've only gotten to know Shihan Andy recently from the tournaments we attend, and it's funny that we never crossed paths while I was growing up, because he lived and trained just an hour away from my home. But we made up for lost time during this interview. I really enjoyed learning more about what makes this man so truly dynamic. I had fun talking to him, and I hope you enjoy listening. Shihan Andy, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Glad to be here. It's great to have you, and looking forward to this. I don't know a whole lot about you, so <laughs> everybody will get to learn about what makes you tick right along with me. Well, it's, that's uh, kind of a scary proposition, but <laughs> let's see what we can do. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> So why don't, why don't you start telling us a bit about you and your martial arts background, how you got started and all that? Uh, well, when I was, I was 10 and a half, uh, and I say that because, um, you know, I kind of tra- you know, keeping track of how long you've been in this business. Um, I was spending the summer at my aunt's place in Texas, and uh, my mom called me on the phone, and it was the Karate Kid time. You know, Karate Kid was out and all the crazy stuff, and... My mom calls me. She says, hey, by the way, when you get home, I signed you and calling up for karate classes. I said, oh, OK, all right, sure. So um, I was there uh, for I was there in Texas for about six weeks. I got home in September and she brought me down to my first class at the rec center in Westbrook with uh, my buddy Colin and um, a gentleman named Tim Steinwalks was teaching the class and Tim was actually a Ishinru practitioner. So um, I got a little Ishinru training on the side as well, but he was teaching Shotokan because uh, him and Tony Fournier had decided that Ishinru was a little bit too tricky to teach the kids at that point, and Shotokan was a little bit easier, so uh, we started a Shotokan. And I went through, um, and I was there for, at the rec center with my buddy Colin, and, and uh, Colin, was one of those kind of kids that, you know, started something, quit it, started, quit it. You know, he was, he wasn't around long, um, but he was in until he got to like his orange belt and he decided to drop out and I stuck with it and kept going. And uh, it, my, my, my favorite thing about being down there at the rec center was, you know, it was a, it was a six week program or an eight week program. So there's always kids coming in and out. And when I started as a white belt, um, it was Monday, Tuesday and Thursday classes. And I did that up until I got my green belt. And then um, Tony would come in and test us for anything from green belt and above. And I was probably 12 or so, 12, 12 and a half, 13 maybe. And uh, he invited me to come to his classes at USM and train there because I loved it so much. So I was going six days a week. And after it was all said and done, when I started as a white belt, there were probably 80 kids in the program and there were probably 25 or 30 uh, brown belts that were ahead of me. And I passed every single one of them and got my black belt before any of those brown belts that were ahead of me when I started. Wow. Yeah. That's a, it's a lot of dedication for someone that young. It, it was, you know, it, it just, it felt right. You know, I mean, I liked what I was doing. I enjoyed, um, the camaraderie. I enjoyed, you know, the friends that I made, I enjoyed being part of something that was just, um, you know, kind of, kind of above everything else, you know, and I liked other sports. I mean, I was a huge football fan, and, but I was small. So, um, I remember playing peewee football for a year and actually having a buddy of mine carry me about 40 yards into the end zone on his back. So, um, <laughs> I figured that uh, football wasn't going to be my, wasn't going to be my forte. So, uh, I, martial arts was just that thing that, you know, and I was a really, I was a small kid, um, not a lot of confidence, um, got beat up, got picked on. Uh, I remember spending two years in Gorham and was just, it was the two worst years of my life. Just beat up all the time, picked on all the time. If you weren't born in that, at that time, if you weren't born there, you didn't belong there. That's kind of how the kids that were in there treated you. And, uh, 
it was miserable. And then we moved to Westbrook, um, things got better. And then that's when, you know, I started karate training and it really helped picked up my spirits. I mean, I was, I was the kid that literally that walked around with his head down, didn't make eye contact, um, was afraid all the time. And karate gave me that confidence to be able to pop my head up and not be afraid to look somebody in the eyes and, and, uh, you know, stick up for myself. Do you remember how old you were or what rank you were when you were able to pick your head up? Yeah, yeah, it was funny because I hit like um, probably probably orange belt, you know. And at that time, um, the ranking system was white belt, yellow belt, orange belt, green belt, brown belt, black belt. And you spent, you know, a certain amount of time in each belt or as much time as you needed. And you could do a checkoff list. We did a whole bunch of different ways of getting tested. And um, so I'd probably been training for about a year and a half. And uh found myself, you know, more confident, found myself, you know, getting up there and being able to perform a form in front of, you know, 60 other kids and have them all cheer you at the end was a cool thing. And Mm -hmm. it really got me to that point where, you know, I mean, I remember being in school one time and having, you know, this, this, the class bully, um, come up to me and I had my tray in my hand and, I don't know what exactly the, the, the reasoning was, but he came up and he was mad at me for something and he takes his hand and he smacked my tray of food out of my hand. It went all over the floor and I was livid. I was hungry. It was just a rough day and I cold cocked him. I mean, I was just, I, I wasn't afraid and I hit him, knocked him over and he just looked at me from the ground and I stormed off and went to the, you know, went and talked to the principal and He's like, you know, you can't do that. And I said, I understand, but you know what? I'm tired of this guy. And that right there was that confidence boost to me. And nobody messed with me anymore. You know, it was a cool thing. I, I was able to stand up for who I was and I walked with my head high and him and I became buddies. You know, it was pretty cool. So, oh, wow. yeah. Well, that's neat. Yeah. Well, not that that wasn't a, a great intro and, and not a good story in and of itself, but do you have a, if I said, tell me your best martial arts stories or something that comes to mind? Um, yeah. And and it's funny for me because, um, you know, I've done, I've done a lot of things. I've got a chance to train with a lot of different people, you know, a lot of smaller name guys that people might know, not know, but, um, you know, some bigger name guys, you know, like, uh, Mike chat, um, Mm-hmm. Uh, Herb Perez, um, Larry mm-hmm. Lamb, a bunch of those guys that were. Do you remember uh, the martial arts masters show? Um, What's it called? It was a TV show on in the early in the mid '80s, early '90s, um, and it was all these martial arts guys. Um, no, there was a yeah. It was it was it was almost like a wrestling show, but with all these karate guys, and they were all they all had these their own handles. They all had their own um, their own. Uh, like superhero names and stuff like that. You know, Larry Lamb was on it and Herb Perez was on it. And there's a whole bunch of these guys that um, had come in and we got a chance to work out with a bunch of them. Uh, Superfoot Bill Wallace, that kind of stuff. You know, I got a chance to train oh, cool. with a lot of the, 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 you know, the big name guys out there. But my favorite martial arts story is happened uh, last year. Last year, my daughter and I um, traveled to Spain. And it was just the two of us. Um, and, it was one of those, it was for, uh, we, I belong to an organization called WOMA, which is the World Organization of Martial Arts Athletes. And um, WOMA has these events that go on all over the world, and it was the Spanish Open um, last year. So we went over, had a great time, but my favorite part of it was her and I doing a synchronized kata together, and we beat the Polish team, we beat the Slovakian team, we beat the British team, we beat the Spanish team, we beat the team from Isle of Man. Um, we, we won the gold medal. And to do that with my, with my daughter, you know, who is my partner in crime, um, doing this stuff together, to do that with her was the best, you know, the best moment for me because, I mean, I've, I've won a lot. I've done a lot of, you know, local stuff. I've done a lot of national stuff and I've done a lot of international stuff and I've won 11 world champions from you know doing these WOMA events but doing that with her was my favorite thing the fact that we got out there and got to compete together and win a gold medal that's my that's my best that's my best martial arts story that's that's great so how much of of the the joy of that was that it was your daughter and how much of it was that I'm going to assume you're she's also your student yep yep so 
you know, is that is that 50-50? There is. A- there is. Yeah, that's the that's the thing, because like um, I I think it's more the fact that she's my you know, she was my kid. You know what I mean? I think the fact that yeah. the fact that she's my student as well, my black belt. And, you know, she's been at this for a long time. And it was funny because when she was little, her and her she has a twin sister. So uh, Drew is my is the daughter that still trains and her twin sister, Taylor, got her third degree black belt. And is in college now studying to be a nurse. So her time is just different. Um, and Drew still trains and she's still with me. And as a matter of fact, she's going to Wales with me in uh, July to, to train, to compete again. Um, but the fact that, you know, these watching these two grow up and coming up through the ranks, I mean, I'm one of those dads that, um, you know, my kids, they each had like 28 stripes on their belt. You get a stripe a month, and they had 28 stripes on their belt, something like that, before they black belt tested. I just, I wouldn't let them do it. They, you were not ready. And I had other kids that, you know, weren't my kids, that were my students that passed them and tested before they did. And, you know, some people were like, well, that's kind of mean, isn't it? I said, nope, I will not have my kids go up there and do this unless I know they're ready for it. And when they were ready, they were ready. And let me tell you, she looked great. And, you know, now she does it and she's out there all the time. And, and it's, it was paid off to make them wait, you know. Um, and so I think the fact that, yes, she was a black belt of mine, but the fact that she was my kid, um, that to me felt, you know, was better because the two of us did this together. You know, it was a, it was an adventure that we took together. It was a journey that we went on together and it was an accomplishment, you know, being there with her. It was just, it was the coolest part. It was definitely cool. Oh, great. Are are you guys going to compete again in Wales together? We are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We're going to try it again over there. So awesome. Same form, different form. Uh, I think we're going to do the same form, and um, we actually we're going to bring um, another uh, boy. He's a Taekwondo kid from uh, from Freeport, um, Ben Morang. He's going over with us, and uh, he's going to do the kata with us. So it'll be the three of us doing representing Team USA doing it together. So it'll be kind of fun. Oh well, cool. Well, of course, we'll have to let everybody know how that goes. Absolutely. When you, when you come back. Yeah. So. Cool. So. When you think about your time in the martial arts, it certainly had an impact on you physically, emotionally, maybe even spiritually. Mm-hmm. How has the martial arts made you a better person with concern to those changes? Well, I remember when I was a kid, um, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I was seven. And my doctor said, um, you know, by the time you're 15 or 16, you'd probably be in a wheelchair. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, that's what you want to hear at seven, you know. Um, And the arthritis was bad. I mean, it was my joints would swell. My knees were bad. Um, And it was one of those where I I didn't run a lot. I couldn't do a lot of that stuff. But when I got into karate, my mom was my mom. Again, I, I credit her a lot with getting her just getting me started. She put me into this thing just out of the blue. And um, she had been talking to a bunch of different people and. They thought, you know, try this and see how it works. So I did it. And uh, for years, you know, I mean, I just kept going and going and going. And when I, at one point, when I finally went back to my doctor, um, I was probably, you know, 13 or so. And we'd do the yearly checkups and that kind of thing. And at one point, he just said to me, he said, I don't know what you're doing, you know, but this karate thing is working for you. Keep it up. And I did. And, uh, you know, the arthritis is one of those kind of things that's supposed to stick and um, it didn't. I mean, I've had I've had tests done over the past few years, and you know, I've been totally clean. Um, sort of beat the thing just by, you know, training and getting my body out there. And that's one of those things. You know, for me, um, the spiritual end of it is to know that if I keep moving, if I keep doing what I'm doing, um, you know, my body's not going to shut down the way a lot of other people's do. You know, when you stop doing certain things, it changes stuff. You know, and I have vowed to myself that I won't change that. I'm going to keep doing what I do because, you know, I, I would have been in a wheelchair. I could have been in a wheelchair. And I can't say I was, but I, it's the possibility of doing that. And I know that what I do now is one of those things that helped keep me healthy. Um, and it's also helped, you know, like you said before, being bullied, being picked on, getting thrown downstairs, getting thrown. I had rotten tomatoes thrown at me as a kid in my backyard. I mean, I just went through a whole whole bunch of stuff. And this has helped me become the person that I am. Um, You know, you've seen me at tournaments. I'm a a goofball. Um, 
I, Absolutely. I, I have a lot of fun, and that's my whole thing. I think that karate training itself should be, you know, for you, but I like to have fun with it, and I like to enjoy the people that are around me. And one of the things that I really like, but what I get to do is it changed me from being that, that introvert, that shy, scared kid into being more of an extrovert and being able to be who I really was. And I get a chance to do that. I get a chance to be with not just my own kids and then my own students, but some of these amazing people that I've met over the years. And I've made so many friends from so many different countries that, you know, we still, we, we talk each, we talk, I talk probably twice a week to uh, a buddy of mine from the Isle of Man. Um, I have a family from Virginia that I met, uh, I'm sorry, Atlanta, that I met while we were over there in, uh, in Wales the first year in 2011, who they come up here to train with me for a couple weeks at a time. Um, I'm always getting updates when they go to, when this family goes to a tournament, the dad calls me on the phone to give his kids a pep talk before they go. Um, it's just all the things that I get to do and be and see are all attributed to the fact that I started martial arts when I was at such a young age. And it's really broadened my horizons. It gives me a chance to meet so many people and to do so many different things. I just, I can't imagine not doing it. Wow. That's, man, you're just full of good stories. That's that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go the other, maybe possibly the other end of the spectrum, okay. something. Um, and, and maybe this is the bullying thing. Maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But think about a low point in your life that you were able to move through or overcome or get past or however you wanted to define it because of your martial arts training and experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, w- I would probably say the whole, um, you know, the, the breaking off from my instructor was a pretty low point. Um, some of the things that I dealt with, some of the things that we went through, um, and not knowing where things were going to go. And when I left, um, I'd have a clue. I had no clue what I was going to do with my life, where, where, where I was going to be, if I was going to open up my own place. And uh, the, the rapport that I built with the students while I was there um, really shone through because I left there on a Thursday night. Um, I was supposed to have, we we're supposed to have a graduation ceremony the, the next Friday. And I was that, that, that Friday night, you know, after the day I left and, uh, I wasn't there and I had done all the graduation ceremonies. I've been part of everything. And, uh, it didn't happen. And, you know, people called me, people would call me on the phone. And on Sunday I had probably 150 phone calls from different parents saying, if you go out on your own, we're going to go with you. We, we love you. We respect you that much that we want to be part of what you're doing. We understand where you are. We understand, you know, what you want from our kids and, we want to be part of that. And wow. it was it, that, that alone, building that rapport with those people, having that happen. So when I opened my door, I was lucky because I opened my door with 100 plus students, which doesn't happen. You know, most people are building their, sure. you know, it's, it's almost like, yeah. it's almost like American Idol. You know what I mean? Some of these guys go to American Idol and they, it's an instant recording contract, you know, because enough people have seen you. And, and I lucked out that way um, to have that happen to me. And, you know, and like I said, you know, my instructor and I had some differences of opinion. We get along great now where we're, you know, we're friends, I would say. Um, but at that point, that was a real low point in my life because I was very scared. I was very nervous. You know, I had just had I literally just had another baby. Um, I had four daughters and my youngest was probably six months old when I had when I had broke off and went out on my own and didn't know what I was going to do. And all of these people there were to support me was amazing. Um, and you know, there was, there was another, one other point where, um, you know, I, I had, as a kid, as a teenager, I got, um, these brain tumors. I had angiofibroma tumors and there's four of them. I had four of them through a span of four, five years. And, uh, they're blood tumors. So basically they were, they weren't cancerous, but had they exploded, they would have killed me. Um, and I didn't realize I had these things until the, the first one, until I got a nosebleed, um, in a class one time and then started bleeding again and then just started bleeding out of the blue. And when I went through the operations and the, the illnesses and stuff, um, 
everybody at the dojo was very supportive. So I had a, I had a, like, you know, not just my own family, but I had all these kids that I were working with and all these people that they would come up and bring, you know, bring me presents and stop into the house. They'd stop by my house and, you know, just kids would show up with their parents just to say hi and to make sure I was okay. And, you know, it was, so it wasn't the actual training itself, but it was the, the people that were built around me, the people that I had as a support system um, that were there to help me get through, you know, a really, a really difficult time. It was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy process. Um, and the three other tumors that I had through the next few years, they were all the same way. Every time I was down, you know, I had parents there picking me up. I had students there picking me up. I had my guys helping me out. I had all of that support and you know, that you don't get that from other things. You know what I mean? The martial arts right. community is so tight and the people that you, are around and the rapport you build and the love that's there it's it's a pretty amazing thing i i could not agree anymore that's that's some heavy stuff but yeah yeah it's you've certainly moved through it in uh, a positive way and you've certainly embraced that challenge and rolled through that obstacle um you know for for anyone listening that hasn't met you that hasn't seen you at a tournament on a weekend or something there you you are a force of nature there especially with the children um you know you're kind of known for hoisting up first place victors yeah. so long as they they fall into a certain weight range um, now now wait a second whether... hold on i hoisted up larry mortensen and larry is not larry's a i'm not saying larry's a big guy but larry is an adult i have i have hoisted up many many grown-ups and okay. it's funny because when i Sometimes when I'm doing adults, I have actually had adults look at me like, you're, you're not going to lift me? <laughs> I'm like, okay, and I'll lift them right up. Doesn't matter how big they are, how small they are, I will do it. And it's, you mentioned that, and I want to just say something to that really quick. Um, one of my uh, a favorite story of mine um, happened a couple of, like six months ago. A little boy who, um, his first tournament, and he's one of uh, Andy Diamato's students, a little boy named Noah, and he, um, at his very first tournament, I had him in my group. He was a white belt and he won. The kid's awesome. And he's just one of the sweetest kids and he's, uh, he's just nice and he's friendly. And so he was like five years old and I lift him up and I'm holding him, I'm parading him around. And for years after that, the kids, he's probably, he was like, like I said, like four or five then. I think he's nine or 10 now, um, still training. And at every tournament, I hoist him up wherever he wins. We do all that stuff. Well, his mother sent me a Facebook message um, like six months ago, and he took second place in the division in each event. And she said um, he, was sitting on the, he was sitting on the bleachers, and he had his head down. And she said, I went over and I'm like, no, what's the matter, buddy? You know what? And he looked, she said, he picked his head up and he nodded, just kind of pointed his head over towards me, to me. And, and, and he, she's like, yeah, she, hon, Andy, what's, what's, what's the matter? He goes, no picking up today. Just like that. <laughs> and I thought that was the, you know what I mean? And she told me that and brought tears to my eyes. It was just the sweetest thing. And so it's... that is, again, that's one of those things that I love about what I do. I mean, if I could, if I could be at a tournament every weekend doing that with those kids, I would do it. It's just, it, that, it just means so much to me to be able to do that with some of these guys. And that's me. That's, you know, kind of how I am. So that certainly is you. And it, I think it's why there are so many people that, uh, that love you that, you know, I mean, you mentioned that you opened your doors with over a hundred students, and who gets to do that? And it's a testament not to your situation or luck or anything. It's it's a testament to who you are, for sure. Well, I appreciate that. So now, why don't you, if, if we exclude your original instructors, mm -hmm. is there someone that you could say was instrumental or pivotal or critical in your martial arts upbringing? Not, not even necessarily as a child. It could be somebody that's in your life now. Yeah, you know, um, beyond my, beyond my mom dragging me there, you know, you know, I won't say dragging me. I wanted to go, but she always went, um, 
she liked to sit outside and she didn't, you know, she didn't see a lot. And when it was tournament time, she wasn't really big on those things, but she was there, you know, had got me to those things and made sure that I was at the dojo. So I give her a lot of credit. Um, one of my old, one of my first instructors, his name was Tim Steinwalks. Um, he was the, the Shinru guy that I initially started with that was teaching Shotokan at the rec center. And Tim was one of those guys that um, I remember what I remember my buddy Colin was always brought up front to demonstrate things. And I said to my mom one time, I was like, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't get it. Why does he always pick Colin? And she talked to him and, and Tim came to me and we sat down. He said, listen, he said, the reason I bring Colin up is because he needs that confidence boost. He said, you don't. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you have confidence. You just don't understand that you have confidence. And once you understand it, once you see it, once it comes out of you, you don't need me or anybody else to tell you you have it. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, again, I was like 11. So it was a really hard thing to understand. Um, but then my buddy Colin dropped out and I did and I kept going, I kept going, I kept going. And then I finally found myself being that, you know, that one, I, kids coming to me for things and asking me to help them with stuff. So that built the confidence there. And Tim and I became really good friends. Um, you know, he, uh, he brought me to meet his instructor who lived in um, East Aurora, New York. Uh, and we went down there for, for a weekend. And then um, I went out to uh, a event with him out to uh, New Mexico. Um, I met one of his friends while we were in New York and he, he invited me to his wedding in Arizona. So we went out to that, <laughs> you know, and we just, we, Tim was always that guy that, um, that really helped me with that boost. You know, he really did that for me. And one of the other guys that, that really stands out is Wayne Mello. Um, I remember meeting Wayne as a kid and Wayne and, you know, Tony Fournier always looked alike. They always reminded me of each other because they had the same hair, they had the same mustache and they used, they were good friends. And they would fight each other on the circuit. I remember, you know, watching the two of those guys sparring one another. And Wayne was just one of those guys that, um, and he's going to kill me if he, if he hears me say this, but we always, we all think of him as like the godfather, you know, he's the godfather of the, of the karate circuit that's out there now because everybody looks up to him. Everybody respects him. And he's one of those guys that's so humble and you could sit and have a conversation with him and he will listen to you and then give you his opinion. And whether you like what his opinion is or not, here it is. This is what I say. And you know, you can use, use my, use my advice or not use my advice. Whatever you want to do is your choice, but this is what I think. And 90% of the time his advice is spot on, you know, it's right there. And he's one of those guys that just, everybody respects so much. And he's, like I said, as being humble, you know, he won, um, he finally won a gold medal out at the, uh, the Azawa cup a couple of years ago, uh, in sparring. And he came back and he didn't want anybody to know. He wanted nobody to talk about it. He didn't have, it was like, oh, and every time somebody would bring it up, he'd just throw his hands up and kind of roll his eyes like, I don't want to talk about it, you know, <laughs> for what he could accomplish and what he did. And he's just, he's one of those guys that I will forever, um, you know, no matter what happens, I will forever remember him growing up as a kid throughout the, you know, the, the stuff, the times that he would come up and the times that we would get to go down there and, and seeing him on the tournament circuit and just the, the respect and love that he gives to everybody is just, to me, one of those things that I've tried to, you know, I've tried to do in his footsteps just because of the way he is. And when I, you know, when I had my falling out with, with, with Tony, I mean, I could go to Wayne and talk to him about that because both Wayne and, Wayne was a, Wayne and Tony, like I said, were like brothers. They were really, really close and really good friends. And I could get, he could see my side of the story as well as Tony's side of the story. And he didn't, he didn't pick sides. He didn't, you know, I, he didn't take you know, the, the, the old friend over the young kid or anything like that, he would sit there and would talk to me about it and would give me, again, just great advice on how to handle things. And anytime something would happen, um, he's the kind of guy that you could always go to and really get some, some good stuff from. He, like I said, so that's why we call him the, the, the godfather. Or he's like Yoda, you know, it's one of those kind of things with him. So uh, he, yeah. Wayne stands out. Yeah, well, uh, what you don't know is that I interviewed Shihan Mello few weeks ago he's going to be episode six oh very which cool is, which is not quite out yet as we're doing this interview uh but the other piece that you may not know 
uh, for me personally is that I went to college in Worcester, Mass, in part so I could train with Sean Mello. I was there for two years. I did not know that. I did yeah, not know that. Um, I earned a brown belt with him, and uh, I like to tell people that this won't mean as, as much to a lot of people listening, but um, I like to tell all the Shotokan guys from down that way that I knew DJ when I was taller than him. <laughs> and so for people listening that don't know me personally, that don't know these folks individually, um, I'm 5'7". And DJ's like 6'3". <laughs> DJ's 9'2", it feels like looking at him. And I remember him when he he must have been 11 or 12 years old. And so I've been tied in with, with that that group, with Shihan Mello, for a long time. They're wonderful, wonderful people. They really and I, are. I agree with everything that you're saying about them. Yeah, they're they're just, you know, they're the, the epitome to me of what what an organization is. And um, also, obviously, you know, Hanchi Almeida, um, yep. who, I, again, I remember as a little kid being mesmerized at him because he was called, sure. he was the Hands of Stone. That was his nickname. And he would break, you know, he'd break concrete blocks with his hands. And to watch him at 10 or 11 years old was scary. It was yeah. scary because he was so thick. And now, you know, you see him walking around and he's just, he's funny. He's so, um, he's just, a, he's like a, he's like a big teddy bear, you know, but he's so unbelievably gifted in all the things that he was able to do. And the organization that he's got out there um, and the people that are part of it, uh, you know, I feel um, uh, while I'm not an ICA member, I feel as a Shotokan practitioner, you know, the, the kinship to that. Um, but I feel as part of the family, cause I'm very close to, you know, all of them, whether it be Mike and Sue or, you know, Donnie and DJ, um, sure. you know, I got a, every time I go down there for something, Donnie puts me up in his house. So, cool. you know, it's just one of those crazy cool. good people. Yeah, they are. They're great people. So we talked a little bit about your, your time with martial arts competition. You know, obviously you, you've competed a bunch. Um, what's your favorite thing about competition? Why did you, why have you and done it so much? Why do you continue to compete? You know, it's funny. I, I um, when I came up, through, when I was coming up as, as a kid, um, I competed up until I was about 17 or 18. And I will tell you, <clears throat> I never took first place, not once, in all the training that I did as a kid. And um, it bothered me. And I got to a point at 18 when I, when I got sick. And um, I just couldn't train for a while. And the, you know, the tumors were there, and they told me if I had got hit in the head, um, you know, it could kill me. So I stopped, I stopped competing and I didn't compete again until I was 34, 34 years old. It was my last year in the 18 to 34 year old division. And, um, one of my guys, Randy, uh, had been competing all this time and I went with them and I, you know, I was there for all the tournaments and was judging and being part of it and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, at that point I was just a corner judge cause you know, I didn't have, um, I didn't have my own tournament. The, 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 the rapport wasn't quite what it was. And I was just, I was learning a lot of stuff. And so Randy's like, Randy challenged me. He goes, listen, you know, you're my instructor. I want you to come to come compete with me at the next event. And it was, it was Alan Viernes's, it was the friendship tournament. And I said, you know what? All right, the hell of it. I'll do it with you. So I got out there and I got to go, I went last which you know how that goes when you compete. Mm -hmm. You go last, that's the best spot to go in, right? Absolutely. So there was probably probably 10 or 15 guys in the division. And uh, I went, competed, and I took first place. And it was the first first place trophy I had ever earned competing in martial arts at 34 years old. And I was like, ah, oh, this is great. You know, and all my, <laughs> all my kids were there, my students were there, my, 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 my own kids were there, my wife was there. And, um, and that was it. I mean, boom, from that moment on, I was hooked and I just competed and competed and competed and competed and competed and kept doing it and kept doing it and, you know, kept winning. And I realized, you know, I'm better than I think I am, you know, and I don't know what it was as a kid that whatever hump it was, but when I finally got over that, it started to just flow for me. And then, you know, I got, um, I got a chance to be sponsored by a friend of mine, um, that owned a place called, um, photo sports and photo sports was an org uh it was a, a website and the guy that owned it um 
had sponsored a few of my karate students. Um, and basically what he did, you know, he sponsored you to go around to different events and take pictures and stuff. And then he would sell the pictures online and hopefully you would get, um, uh, offered to do like seminars and that kind of thing. So, um, I did photo sports for a couple of years and that's where I hooked on with Bruce from WOMA and, um, started doing some of the international competitions and the international competitions for me, I, I, I enjoy them more than I do the local stuff. And the only reason is, is because with the local stuff I'm competing, you know, it's all guys that I know, you know what I mean? It's all guys that you compete sure. against that you've seen forever, you're friends with. And you know, if, if I take first place one week and then uh, Mike Sonia takes first place the next week and whatever, we're, we're buddies, it's back and forth. When you go over to these international competitions, I'm competing against, I've never seen before. Some guys now I have, because it's been, you know, I've been doing it for five years and um, well, this will be my fifth year um, doing the international stuff. So I've made friends and I've, you know, but there's always somebody different. There's always somebody new. There's always four or five guys that are new in your division. So I might go in a division uh, for, um, they do them based on style. So they have hard style, soft style, Korean style, Japanese style, tiny, Tai Chi, whatever. Um, so if I'm in my hard style, Japanese traditional divisions, and then they do a master's division. So the only way to be in this division is if you're a third degree or up. So when you're in those things, there's always new guys coming in and it's always a challenge because I don't know. I don't know. Looking at these people, I've, I might've seen them warm up, but I've never seen them do a form before. I, I don't know what to expect. And that to me is that it's that it's that unknowing, you know what I mean? It's that it's the, Hmm, I look at this guy and you can see his build, you see the way he walks and you kind of think, okay, this guy's going to be this. And sometimes they're fantastic. Sometimes they're terrible and mm. you never know. And that's to me, the fun part about the comp, the, the competing and the competition is a keeps you young. B, it's good for your, your students to see you doing it because you want them to do it. You've got to be out there doing it too. And then C, it's the, it's the never knowing. It's the surprise. You know, it's the, <clears throat> it's the, you get in that ring and if I go first, I have no idea what the other guy's doing behind me. If I go last, I can see what everybody else is doing and then I can kind of judge on, you know, okay, that guy was really good. I liked what he did. This guy was really good. These other guys, not so much. So, you know, I'll do this. I might change my form. I might change in my mind what content I'm going to do five times before I actually get on the, on the floor and do it, you know? Uh -huh. So it's, it's, it's the, the not knowing for me, which makes the competing part very fun. And I tell my kids, I still get nervous. I walk the second I walk up on that stage, and most of the international competitions now are up on big stages. Um, you know, the second you get up there, my, my, I get the sweats. You know, my eyes go glossy. Uh, my, my hands start to sweat. I start to mm. feel like I'm going to pass out. And then you compete and you do it and you're in the zone, man. It's just, it's, there's nothing like being in that space where nobody else can touch you. You know what I mean? You're, yeah. you're there. It's you. And everybody's, everybody's eyes are on you. And it's really a cool, it's just that cool feeling to know that all these people are watching you and when they're done you know you get that oh man that was really cool and people come up to you and they go i don't i i, I don't even know how to say you know some of the things that some of these people say to you at the end of a, at the end of a, an event when you're sweating and you're you've just given 180 percent you've given everything you absolutely have and the sweat's pouring off your body and you're breathing funny and people walk up to you and just high five you and they're like, man, that was fantastic. There's no better feeling than that. It's, it's just, it's just cool. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, there, there are, there's little other than martial arts competition. I mean, there's some other, other things, you know, maybe dance competition, but individual competition, you know, for that 60, 90, 120 seconds, the world is yours. Yeah. You own it. And ev everybody's watching you. They're watching for good or for bad. And to to be in that spotlight is a feeling that outside of martial arts competition, a lot of people don't get to experience. Yeah, and they and they never will, you know. And that's it's you say, you know, you that the world is yours. And that's one of the, you know, that's you just you're there, you know. And you, no matter what you do, ninety percent of the eyes in that room are standing on, are right on you. They're trained on you, and you have a chance to to blow people away or you have a chance to make people go, hmm, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I tell my kids all the time, you want, you want people to go, that's a black belt, not that's a black belt. So, you know, it's, it's, you get that chance to put that view into people's eyes as to what a black belt should look like. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. That's right. So you've talked about a, 
lot of different martial artists that you've had the opportunity to train with. You're, you're certainly very fortunate in the number of people that you've gotten a chance to work out with. Uh, but if you could train with anybody, any one person, living or dead, who would that be? Yeah, I, I would I would definitely have to say it would be Funakoshi. You know, I mean, Funakoshi for for me as, you know, the, the grandfather of modern day martial arts, you know, the, with with that title, the way everybody considers him. And, um, you know, the fact that he was the guy that, you know, finalized our style. I wouldn't say created our style because, you know, there were guys that came before him and he put his stamp on it to make things what it is, you know, mostly what it is today. Um that would be the guy, you know, I, it, you know, I look at him as, um, you know, the grandfather type. And again, I, I use Yoda, you know, he's like the Yoda of martial arts to me, you know, sure. with all the Jedis around him, that's Yoda. That's the guy that everybody, you know, strives to not maybe be, but to honor. And that's how I look at it. I, when I do something, I want to honor that. I want to honor what he is and what he was and the things that he did and hopefully someday, you know, be that kind of force in, you know, what it is that I do. So I would, I would have to be Gichin Funakoshi. Cool. So I'm, I'm really interested. This, this might be the question I was most interested to ask you, knowing your, your ties to, well, I mean, you've mentioned Yoda a couple times, so I'm guessing you're a Star Wars fan, but I know you as quite the comic book aficionado. Yes. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Uh, you know, it's funny because I love, I love the karate movies. I love all that stuff. I think that my, probably my favorite one that I have seen right now is, uh, 13 Assassins. Have you seen that? I haven't. It is, um, it's, it's one of those, um, the end of the movie itself is like, and see, and it's so like, I mean, I like Jackie Chan and I like, um, you know, Bruce Lee, of course, and all those, you know, all those guys. I love all of that stuff. But for me, this, you know, 13 Assassins is one of those movies that, um, and it was, it's subtitled, it's Japanese film. Um, mm-hmm. And it has the, the end scene between these 13 warriors and, uh, or these 13 rogue samurais that they put together um, to take down this shogun is uh, it's like an hour and a half. Mm. And it's the battle scene to end all battle scenes. It's just, it's phenomenal. It's just one of those movies cool. that I could watch over and over again. And it's funny because there's part of it that like the reason why they're going after this guy, the guy was brutal. And some of the events that take place in this thing, you're just like, oh my God, I, I couldn't even film that. You know, and to watch mm. it, it was really disturbing. And then to see this guy at the end, what happens to him, it's just, it, if you haven't seen 13 Assassins, I highly recommend watching that movie. Because for me, uh, you know, like I said, Jackie Chan and all the stuff that he's done, um, and, you know, and, and uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Bloodsport and all those guys, you know what I mean? John Club, Van Damme. Yeah, Van Damme. Yeah, Van Damme. Yeah. All that stuff. I love those guys. Love it all. I've seen them all. Jet Li. I love Jet Li. I love like uh, uh, Forbidden Kingdom with Jet Li and and uh, and Jackie Chan. That's a great. Yeah, movie. I love that movie. Absolutely. But great Thirteen movie. Assassins is probably my favorite martial arts movie because it's just it's beyond everything else, and it just gives you a real insight into the old days of you know what samurai warriors were all about. It's crazy, crazy movie. Oh, cool. Well. Um... We'll link to that as well as some of the other things that you're talking about in the show notes on, on the website on whistlekickmartialartsradio.com so people can see exactly what we're talking about and, and hopefully find and watch that movie. So, so do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Uh, uh, no, not really. Okay. Uh, you know, it's like I said, I, I, li- I, I like Jet Li a lot. I think Jet Li's great. Jet Li's phenomenal. Um, and, you know, of course... The Jackie Chan stuff, you know, Jackie Chan was one of those guys that, um, you know, everybody can like, everybody can love because of, you know, he had his serious time and then he went into the the fun kind of family oriented stuff and, you know, all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, as far as, you know, like a actor per se, you know, I, I really don't, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. it? It is a little bit. Is there anybody you think's overrated? Um... 
<laughs> um, I'm going to get crucified for saying this. That's why I'm asking because yeah, I figured okay. you'd be willing to put yourself I'm out there. I'm willing to put myself out there. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm really tired of all the, the Chuck Norris jokes. The Chuck Norris is, you know, the on the eighth day or ninth day, God created Chuck Norris. All the Chuck Norris stuff. I think um, for what Chuck Norris was in his heyday, it was amazing. And I think he was amazing. And I just think what he's kind of gravitated into, you know, the and again, religion and all that stuff. I hate talking about it because I have my own opinions and things and everybody has their own opinions on things. But it's one of those things where I really think that he's trying to force a lot of his religious stuff on people nowadays as he gets older. Um, you know, so I don't know if he's quite a born again Christian or any of that kind of stuff, but a lot of the stuff that he's gone into, um, for me is just, it's just too much. Um, I think that religion should be one of those things that, you know, it's your thing. You do what you want with it and you enjoy it as you want. And I don't need it forced on me. I mean, I'd rather sure. watch, I'd rather watch his movies and, you know, walk a Texas Ranger and all that stuff because I love that stuff. Um, and, and I loved all his, his old flicks. I thought they were great. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would, I don't know if I, like I said, I don't know if I'd say he was overrated. I certainly wouldn't say that, but I just think I'm just kind of beyond You're him. Over him. Yeah, I'm just kind of yeah. over him. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Um. Maybe, maybe to continue the meme, I, I should say, you know, the opinions expressed of our guests are not necessarily those of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Probably so should. Hopefully Chuck Norris doesn't beat down my door and, and kill me. Yeah. I don't know. He's a great guy. I mean, I, I didn't, I, well, I was at a seminar in Vegas. I was at the Martial Arts Super Show the year that he got um, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I thought he was, he was very personable. You know, we didn't get a chance to meet him. He was very you know, there was a lot of people there, and he kind of kept his distance, which I can understand. Um, but he, um, but he seemed to be, you know, quite quite down to earth and that kind of stuff. I just, like I said, it's all the other stuff that I'm kind of done with. Sure, I understand. How about books? Any any great martial arts books you'd recommend? Yeah, there's um, there's a book. Where is it? I'm trying to find it. It's called Shotokan Secrets, um, and. I, forget the name of the author. It's Bruce something, um, Dr. Bruce something. And it's basically, um, he takes a look at all the old Shotokan stuff, um, all the katas, uh, and he gives sort of his theory on where things came from. It's a great book. Um, and oh, cool. a lot of bunkai in there. It's a really fun. And then, I, and Karate Do My Way of Life is my, is probably my favorite karate book, uh, short of, uh, you know, martial arts book. Um, it's, it's the, uh, it's the autobiography of Gishin Funakoshi and it just, it gives great detail into him and how he was and, you know, where he came from and his philosophies and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed that book. It's one of the, and it's a short read. It's, it's, you know, it's only like, you know, 200 pages or something like that. Um, sure. And I've, I've read it numerous times and I enjoy reading that book. It's one of those books that I go back to um, whenever I just need a little, you know, something, spiritual something, yeah. you know what I mean? It's kind of like my short, my karate Bible, so to speak. So. Oh, great. Uh, and we'll, of course, link both of those. So we're, we're starting to wind down. Two questions left. Okay. Any martial arts-related goals that you have for the future? Yeah, I still um, – so when, when we do um, our World Games, I go to the World Games, and I've gone the past four years now, and, you know, this is my, well, my, my fifth coming up. And um, the Elusive Grand Championship there has gotten me every year. I've been in the Grands um, – and I've come in second every year by half a point, a tenth of a point, something like that. Um, and it's been very close with some of these guys. Now, I'm 44 years old. And the guys that I'm over there competing against, the guys that keep beating me, uh, this guy named Jason Baird, who is just – he's a phenomenal martial artist. Um, he's a, a pretty big deal over in England. Um, and he's uh, – he, he does, you know, TV stuff. He's been on, um, you know, he's a sponsor or he's sponsored by some men's health magazines over there. He does some pretty big things. He's a great guy. Um, but that jerk has beaten me twice now. I kind of get past him. Um, and then I have another friend of mine. His, his uh, name's Dave Pearson. And in, in Ireland, when we were in Ireland together, um, it was him and I for the Grands. And well, they're, they're, I can't say they're... they're I hate to say it that way. There were five of them. There were four or five of us um, that were um, had gotten chosen. And what they do with these over there is they take um, 
all the divisions and they take all the division winners. And again, there could be 15 or 20 divisions. So they take the number one guy from each division and then they have a runoff. And then during the runoff, they take the top three and then you come back for the grand championship um, mm. the, on Sunday night. And uh, so I've had, um, I've lost to Jason twice in the grand championship. And then um, I lost to Dave once so far. And when I lost to Dave, it was broadcast on this Irish um, website all over the world. So it was, it was cool because Dave beat me. And so there are five, there are five judges. I get two nine nine nines and three nine nine eights, and he gets three nine nine nines and two nine nine eights. Like ah, mm. you know. <laughs> so, so I lost to him on that. And um, but the funnest part about that was it was it was you know seven or eight o'clock at night in Ireland, but it was like you know two o'clock in the afternoon or noontime over here in the states. So my wife and two of my daughters were in a blueberry field watching it on. Um, an iPod or an iPad, uh, iPhone. My uh, my youngest daughter, who's six, who's she's sixteen now, she's fifteen at the time, but she was driving with her girlfriends down to um, Fenway Park to see Justin Timberlake, and uh, she was watching it in the car. My <laughs> other daughter was in Texas watching it with my aunt. My dad was in Florida watching me compete for the very first time. He'd never seen me compete before, and he's watching it online streamed you know all around the world i had uh friends of mine in hawaii california all these people were sending me all these things we're watching you we're watching you're watching we got it on and you know and i i lost um by the one tenth of a point it was, it was oh frustrating but it was cool so that's my that's my thing my elusive uh grand championship that's the one thing that i want to get and i'm hoping that you know this year is the year um i got my fingers crossed we'll see what happens well i wish you luck I appreciate and I'm sure that very that, much. You know, many of us will be following what's going on with you over there and the, the other folks that are headed over. So that leaves us with our last question. Do you have any parting words of wisdom, any advice for the people listening to this episode? The only thing that I would say is if it's something you love, do it. Keep up. Stick with it. You know, I mean, it's so easy nowadays to to back away, to walk off something, to give up, to quit. And, you know, we have kids that do it, that get frustrated. Um, you know, we're in a, in a sort of society nowadays of, you know, instant gratification, you know, with with the way technology is and all the stuff that, you know, life brings to you. If you love it, do it. Stay with it. Keep it up, because in the long run, all that matters is how you feel. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You know, I tell my kids all the time, there's one person in this world that can make you happy, sad, excited, disappointed, and that's you. So whatever it is that you're doing that is right for you, keep it up and enjoy it because that's what life's all about. Very, very well said. Well, um, now's your turn. If it, what do you have going on that people might be interested in? I know you run a tournament over the summer. Yep. Tell us about stuff you've got going on that people may be be interested. We have our, uh, we do have, we have our summer spectacular. It happens June 27th this year. It'll be at uh, XL Sports World in Saco, Maine. Um, we are the only tournament on the circuit that does, on the Ipone circuit that does continuous sparring. So we have a continuous sparring division, which has been a lot of fun and it's, it's increased amazingly over the past couple of years. Uh, first year we had eight competitors, last year we had 55. Um, wow. Yeah. And then, um, and we also do with that, we have our demo team competitions and we have our um, synchronized kata, synchronized weapons. So we do a bunch of different things with that. And, uh, and that's a lot of fun. So that's my big thing coming up. I'm trying to, you know, work on putting things together, getting our uh, awards ready and all that kind of stuff right now. So that's kind of what I'm doing right at the moment. Great. Yeah, of course, we'll, we'll link to your website and, and to that there. Uh, and if anyone wants to reach you, is there a contact information on your website that there is you can steer people to okay there is fantastic absolutely um all my information is right there on our website and you can uh, you know i'll uh, i'm sensei andy at main.rr.com that's my email address and, you know send an email or anything like that any questions anything you want to do anything uh, i can do for anybody else please feel free to ask Great. Yeah, we'll link that. And for people that don't want to hit the show notes, the website's dragonfireme, as in main.com. 
Well, Shihan Andy, I really appreciate you being on today. I had a lot of fun talking to you. Uh, we probably could have kept going another couple hours if <laughs> if we had the opportunity, but I know you've got some structural issues to attend to in your dojo. Yeah, yeah, I got a few things going on right now, so <laughs> yeah, I work on that. But I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a lot of fun, um, and uh, you know, I look forward to. Even if we don't get to do this again, you and I just sitting down and talking about some other things. I got some, you know, you got some lineage that I want to know about too. So, oh well, hey, maybe someday we'll we'll flip it and you can be the interviewer and I'll be the guest. Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, and I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. All right, Jeremy. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Wasn't this a good episode? I don't know. I thought it was. Big thank you to Shion Andy for coming on and talking to me. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of our weekly episodes. If you like the show, we'd really appreciate a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you download your podcasts. You can check out the show notes with links to all of the books, movies, and more that we talked about, and those are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about the great products we make at Whistlekick, please check us out at whistlekick.com. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.